<laughs> okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology Indexing Transformation Seminar Series. Um, I will be your chair for today. I'm not really going to do anything except um, keep an eye on the, on, on the questions and things and an eye on time. So um, I'd like to start now to hand over to Bernard to introduce the theme of the seminar and some of the speakers before, before we continue. Okay, over to you, Bernard. Okay, welcome, welcome everybody to today's event. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you here, uh, many from Stellenbosch, but many from institutions across our country. Um, so I wanted to use a few minutes to explain my idea for the seminar and the invitation I sent out um, to several speakers and uh, hopefully that will allow um, you to understand how they're framing their responses in a sense to my provocations. Um, so I'm going to speak for about five or six minutes um, to just frame the event and then each speaker will will have up to 15 minutes to to um, to present their uh, responses uh, and then um, we'll have question time at the end. Um, so let me start then with the idea of the seminar. Um, I've deliberately invited those teaching theory as opposed to those producing it, right? Or only producing it. I've limited the invitations to sociology departments. In addition to those presenting today, I sent out invitations to three other institutions. And of course, there are many other institutions that could be involved. So I hope that this is the beginning of a range of discussions um, in future on, on teaching theory um, in South Africa. I'm concerned here with establishing both the content of theory pedagogy and its form. In other words, both what is taught and how it is taught. Obviously, there's some relation between them. How much space is allocated on the curriculum to theory does have an influence on what can be taught, with what depth and so forth. There's also the related question of whether theory is regarded as some kind of professional prerequisite for a degree in sociology or whether students are expected, say at the postgraduate level, to produce work that can stand as theoretical in its own right. So in terms of content, of course, the historical moments in which we find ourselves is framed by persistent racial inequalities, by environmental and climate disaster, and these to some extent have shaped contemporary attention towards decolonial perspectives and, and to the Anthropocene. In addition, in South Africa and elsewhere, there's a broad recognition of the implication of knowledge with colonial power and the demand to produce knowledge adequate to the experience of the colonized in general and Africa in particular. So where does this leave us with respect to the contents of the sociological canon? For some, perhaps it is enough to point to Hegel's discussion of Africa in his philosophy of history to, implicate, to indicate the implication of European theory in racism and white supremacy, and thus to search for new beginnings from a range of disparate kinds of pre-colonial writings, or alternatively those produced by liberation thinkers on the continent, either during colonialism or after. For others, it might mean taking a particular moment of theory from the last 50 years, for instance, in the thoughts of a more recent canon canonical thinker like Bourdieu, Foucault or Butler, and reading these alongside contemporary African writers, or perhaps taking feminism as a theoretical starting point and working through its various waves or focusing on African fem feminism or queer theory. But what do we do with figures like Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois? If these figures were key influences in the founding of the discipline more than a century ago, should we still teach them? And if so, how? Is there something in the traditions of, the, of critique that each of them offers that are still valuable? Does the fact that none of them suggest any immediate solutions to the structural problems that they identify uh, make them worth our students' efforts? In short, is there any payoff to reading the classical sociological theory canon? And we might ask, what is the implication of our position if we don't read this canon? and we insist on local theory within an ever more global world? Does it render our theory parochial and inadvertently produce relations in which South Africa and the global South 
is marginal to theoretical practice. Here, I did want to mention the framing of a famous course on the canon, Systems, taught by the Haitian scholar Michel Rolf Triot at the University of Chicago. In his 2001 introductory notes to the syllabus, he suggests, quote, canons are arbitrary, but the relevance of the canonical corpus to current issues depends on the questions we put to that canon. He goes on to point out the importance of reading carefully to recognize the silences that the prevailing canon relies on and creates in a manner that implicates Christendom, colonial conquest, and centuries of political struggle. So it is important to note that in his reading, the promise is to read the canon closely, not as offering an uncritical critical truth of society in general, but rather for what it makes and for what it hides. But he does not approach the categories of classical sociological theory as too fraught to be wielded, as untouchable. Situating them within a set of problematics, he argues, can offer a way to grasp the contemporary world. For me, from his position, there emerges an imperative not to blindly follow the canon, but rather to create canons, genealogies of thought, which offer a set of concepts that can illuminate the presence, allow, allowing us to see thing, things in a new way. This leads me to a second set of considerations that motivated the seminar and that I put to, uh, to the, the presenters today. And this has to do with the form of teaching theory. To address this, we need to mention that the conditions of teaching theory in South Africa are quite sharply distinguished from the conditions in which theory is celebrated and where it is produced. At research institutes such as Weiser at WITS, the Center for Humanities Research at UWC, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at UCT, thematic foci orange scholars and doctoral students around particular sets of readings and seminar topics that aim to, to address a global audience and to nurture a close reading of theory. But these institutes are cut off from much of the teaching of theory in the social sciences. Indeed, where theory is taught is in academic departments. In sociology, which typically has first year enrollments in different departments in many universities exceeding 500 and, first year, and third, final year enrollments exceeding 200, how should theory be taught? Do we have the means to actually teach the close reading of texts, the ability to recognize implicit and explicit threads of thought running from one text to the next, or from one corpus of thought to the next? Must our attention be on the pass rates? To what extent are we caught in a kind of local version of a global division of scholarly la labor? that shapes not only who can make theory and who must repeat it, but also who can be taught theory, and for whom theory seems nothing more than an abstract luxury. So I'm curious to hear from all of you, how do you position yourself in relation to these discussions about theory, in terms of content and in terms of the form? And we are lucky to, to have with us today colleagues from four institutions who will speak to these questions, right? They are uh, Dr. Avias Katsura from Sociology at WITS, Professor Vasu Reddy, who is Dean of Humanities at Pretoria, but teaches theory and sociology, Dr. Faisal Garba from Sociology at UCT, and Professor Marlies Rabe, who, who chairs sociology at UWC. So please, 15 minutes each uh, in that order. Uh, if you have questions, please hold, hold them for the uh, for the half an hour at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, and obvious, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bernard. And uh, thank you thank you to all colleagues who, who are in attendance. Uh, it is very nice to see uh, colleagues, uh, some of whom we know. I see my colleague from Viz there, Tatenda, who is now teaching the undergraduate course that I taught for five years before we took over. So I, I'm very glad that we are able to, to get into a conversation about teaching sociological theory. I know I have 15 minutes, so I'll try to be fast and to limit my, my talk to just a few points. So how do we, how do we teach sociological theory? 
you know, in South Africa. And the question uh, posed is uh, on the what and the how of teaching sociological theory in, in the context of South Africa. And my response, although it hasn't been easy to arrive at a, a, a specific response, is, uh, is a proposal to think conversationally. So my, my argument would be that to teach sociological theory in, a, in, in the context of South Africa, uh, we would benefit a lot from a conversational approach. What do I mean? In simple terms, of course, this means we need to treat theory as a conversation. And uh, to my thinking, this allows us to avoid binary thinking uh, and to Take theory or the teaching of theory is a process of, of learning, of core learning uh, across space and time, uh, which means we learn from, uh, you know, different historical epochs. We learn from, you know, theories produced in different geographical contexts. And of course, we also learn from our, our own local contexts. So I want to propose about uh, three approaches to this conversational approach or to this conversational way of teaching sociological theory. Number one is what I refer to as the intertextual conversation. Uh, by this, I mean that we need to focus perhaps on, uh, you know, setting up theoretical texts into conversation. That is, you know, there are a number of conversations that can be set up. Uh, we can set up classical theories into conversation with other classical theories. Uh, if we go back to you know the foundational you know background of sociology, of course there are a lot of theories produced by you know by the so-called dead white European males, uh, Max Weber, Dacke. Uh, so in my approach, I wouldn't throw them away, but I would uh, set them up in a conversation with themselves, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, and uh, and of course I also. I would encourage setting up conversations between these classicals and uh, contemporaries. That is, theories produced later on uh, in, in various contexts, of course, eh? both the European context, the American context, uh, and of course, uh, also the African context. I would also, in this conversational approach, uh, textual, intertextual conversation, I would be interested in you know, setting up so called Eurocentric theories against uh, or in conversation with, you know, uh, you know, black radical thought in sociological theory, or what others would refer to as the Afrocentric approach. Uh, there are a number of theories that would come to mind, you know, including some of those already mentioned by Bennett, uh, who produced the theory in the context of struggle for liberation, you know, in, in the African continent, on the African continent, for example, but also in other contexts such as Latin America, uh, Asia, ETC. And uh, it would be also interesting, in my view, you know, to, to set up conversations between other theories and other theories. In other words, theories that have not been traditionally regarded as part of the canon can also be set up in, into conversation with each other. You know, you know, it could be theories from the so-called global south that we can put uh, into conversation. Theories produced in the context of uh, Latin America, for example, uh, can be set up into conversation with theories produced in, uh, in African contexts. And of course, other theories that have, been not, that have not been part of the canon, you know, including feminist theories, for example, could also be set up into conversation with, uh, with other brands of thinking or ways of thinking within sociology, you know, that have not been part of the canon, of, uh, you know, of what we traditionally refer to as the canon. Right, so, my approach also would be to think more broadly in terms of sociological of social theory beyond social beyond sociological theory. We need to open up, you know, the terrain to speak broadly to what we refer to as social theory. This is a call to some kind of interdisciplinary interdisciplinary approach to to the discipline, you know, to sociology, introducing a way of thinking that connects with other, you know, cognitive disciplines, you know, within the academic field. So the focus here, for example, would be to establish debates, you know, between these texts, establish, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, contestations 
you know, contestations, theoretical contest, contestations on issues, you know, establishing, you know, complementarities, you know, between thinkers. And of, of course, also looking at, uh, you know, applications and replications of sociological theory beyond, you know, the, the ge ge geographical context in which, you know, those theories are generated. And uh, emphasis, of course, would be on inclusivity, you know. In other words, when you are putting up texts into conversation with each other, we need to desist from, uh, you know, you know, thinking hierarchically, you know, as if one text is more important than the other. Uh, you know, we put them on a pedestal of, uh, of, uh, of, of equity and equality and try to see how those engagements, you know, shape up and what comes out of those engagements between these different theories coming out of different historical epochs and different, uh, you know, geographical contexts. So that is uh, uh, that is it on my point number one on intertextual conversation. Uh, number two would be a, a thematic focus. You know, uh, you know. In, in in this conversation, my focus would be to actually bring together theorists into themes. You know, so these conversations will take place in the context of themes. I think this is uh, what we've been doing. I think even at Vitz. And I believe you know everybody here has been doing something you know similar, where theorists are clustered according to themes. This this does not actually you know group them according to the times in which they were writing necessarily, but according to the themes that have been dealt with over the years. And of course, within sociology, we know that there are certain themes that have uh, you know attained some kind of prominence. And of course, this is not to, for to close off other uh, new themes you know within the discipline. So. There is a tendency to cluster theories according to issues, sociological issues. For example, I mean, we know, especially in the context of South Africa, social stratification, I think, is a, you know, one of the major themes. And we could group in a number of theories to think about and, or to think through the question of social stratification. And that can allow you to move beyond the canon, you know, to connect the canon with more contemporary you know, ways of thinking, uh, you know, as far as you know, social stratification is concerned. There are a number of theories that can, uh, you know, be brought, you know, into conversation here. Examples would, of course, you could even, you know, you know, introduce under this theme the canon, you know, Marx and Engels, Weber. But you could also bring in, you know, you know, more contemporary thinkers. For example, Quasi Bochway, you know, just to try to think about about the question of social stratification. And of course, here <laughs> even some of those uh, liberation, you know, you know, thinkers, you know, such as, uh, you know. Pame Kruma, you know, from the African context, you know, can 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 be put into conversation alongside even thinkers like Julius Nyerere. When you are, we are trying to think about the you know, social stratification, these become useful thinkers from uh, you know the African you know context. So other themes, you know, that might be of significance are themes relating to social and political struggles, uh, which are also very very important, you know, to sociology. Without me mentioning individual theories. Right, and also issues to do with modernity, theorizing modernity. This can bring in a number of theories you know, to to the table for discussion in the context of sociological theory, and uh, issues of social order and disorder uh, also bring in a number of theories into conversation. Issues relating to cultural domination bring in a number of theorists. I mean, from uh, the, the so-called uh, you know Eurocentric theories to the you know. Africa centered or Afrocentric theories or you know black, black radical theories they can be brought to the table here you know to discuss issues to do with cultural domination. Of course, there is room to you know to focus on particular threads of theory. I mean, for example, one could one could you know establish a conversation within the frame of feminist thinking, feminist theories, or within the frame of radical black thought or any other theme of of, of concern could be brought you know into this kind of uh, you know, you know, approach, which is a, a theme-focused conversation in sociological theory. That will be my second approach. My third approach, which is my final one, you know, in this presentation, would be to treat theory as living, sociological theory as living theory. In other words, when we read sociological text, we read it as live text. You know, we, we think through this text and try to locate ourselves within this text, whether the text is, uh, 
you know, from the geogra geographical context of uh, Europe or North America, or from the geographical context of Latin America, or from the geographical context of Africa, we it will be beneficial through this approach to read it as a live text and to position ourselves into the text as we read it. So that is what we call living theory. In this, through this approach, we are able to set up you know, a conversation between the text that we are reading, between the theory that we are reading, and our histories, you know, our present realities, our futures, and of course, our own positionalities, or uh, whether be they position, positionalities related to gender or positionalities related to, you know, to our location, be it, uh, you know, a location in Africa or Latin America or wherever we are located in the context of, uh, in our context, of course, our location in South Africa. You know, so theory, we, when we read it, we speak to our, you know, we make it speak to our own positionality, you know, as it were, which is very important. And this brings theory to life, you know, in the context of the everyday, right? We try to apply this theory and critique it, reading it with a critical mind by taking into consideration our everyday lives, by taking into consideration our everyday struggles, by taking into consideration our everyday surroundings, by taking into consideration, of course, our everyday experiences, by taking into consideration projections about our future. Uh, here, even our colonial histories matter when we read sociological theory. So the what part of, you know, of sociological theory in terms of the, the content is very important, but the how part for me is even much more important. How do you read, you know, you know, the theory? How do you read? Do you read Karl Marx? How do you read Weber? How do you read Frank, uh, uh, Franz Fanon? How do you read Amico Cabral? I think that is the, the key question for me. And how does Cabral speak to my present reality? I think that is the question that we ask our students to engage with. You know, so that is the third approach: reading theory as as live text, as it were. So those are the three approaches. So maybe just uh, to offer two further comments before I conclude my, 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 my presentation. So I, I think that through this conversational approach, we are not necessarily, necessarily focusing on encyclopedic, you know, encyclopedic uh, approaches where we want, we want to, to recount how much the students know necessarily, uh, but we are focused more on uh, inculcating a culture of critical reading so that when students are able to read critically any text presented before them, you know, the focus is on the translatability of these skills. Because, you know, given the time limits we have in our universities, you are told to teach sociological theory, for example, in six months. There's no way you can cover the entire spectrum of what we call sociological theory, or even, you know, a, a, a huge chunk of it. So it is better to focus on inculcating, you know, critical reading skills of theory. Of course, uh, in my case, you know, you know, putting up front the idea of theory as conversation, right? So even if you read the original text, uh, which I always encourage that uh, as much as possible, especially where there's a background, you know, if, for example, the, the, theory, the theory course is in third year, we presume that there's a bit of background from first year. So where there's background, we encourage students to to, to, to be able to engage with the original text to, you know, as much as possible, and to be able to see themselves in that original text, you know, to read it as a live text, even if it was, it was written, you know, 90 years ago. So that is also very, very critical for me. So we are, I, I, would, be, I would be worried about, uh, you know, given the time limitations, trying to generate, you know, you know or to try to achieve an encyclopedic, you know, <laughs> you know, set of knowledge for the students. I believe that this is possible uh, as a byproduct of uh, their, their attempts to read the theory as a conversation. Of course, I mean, over time, uh, whether you like it or not, as, soon as, as long as you read the theory, you end up achieving some kind of uh, you know, encyclopedic understanding of, of sociological, uh, sociological theory without us actually as, uh, as teachers of sociological theory emphasizing that, you know, that, uh, that, that issue of, uh, you know, a wide spectrum of understanding of all the theories, but uh, this becomes a, pro a byproduct of our, our, our attempts because time is always a limiting factor. So what we need is to keep equip our students to be able to go out there and engage with the theoretical texts, even beyond what they have been taught in class. Once they master how to read the theory, for me that is central. Then the issue of how much they know, you know, can always come into play 
if they are interested in engaging more with the various texts presented before them or through their own research, uh, then that will be fine for me. I think that is it from me. Uh, I, I think I've already exceeded my time. Okay, yes. Thank you very much, uh, timekeeper. I'm sure you can see that I've ex exceeded my time. That is by way of my conclusion. <laughs> no problem. No, no, no. It was actually very, uh, very, very close to being on time. So thank you very much for keeping an eye on it. Um, yeah, and thank for obviously the fascinating talk. We'll have some questions uh, towards to, to, towards the end. I'd like to now invite um, our next speaker, that is uh, Professor Basu Reddy from um, the University of Pretoria, uh, to take the floor. Um, I will spotlight you, and you may, um, of course, use your video. And again, 15 minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, if, with your permission, I, I mean, I'll put on the uh, camera a little later, but I, I have my notes on the screen, so it's a bit uh, difficult. But I just wanted to acknowledge and say thank you for the invitation to burn it uh, and to, to share some ideas with, uh, with colleagues. Um, it's quite exciting to hear some very interesting insights. Thanks. So I'll switch off now as I go to my notes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the conversation is quite timely. It brings up uh, real pertinent questions that I think are relevant not only to sociology as a discipline, but certainly to other disciplines that you know are cognate. Uh, certainly, also uh, as a teacher, you know, my relationship to the curriculum uh, and and its construction, which my colleagues just now talked about, and the kind of choices we make uh, in all of this. I teach the postgraduate course in social theory. It is a core module in the honors program in sociology. There's a couple of other core modules. I have taught this course or, or taught the course at an undergraduate level for a few years, but now largely for the last several years focused on the postgraduate component. What I will do is uh, take the following uh, set of uh, approaches to the uh, question that Bernard had put. I think there's about six questions there. So my response is somewhat instrumental, Bernard, if you wouldn't mind, but in a way I would hope to touch on some of those questions uh, uh, as, as responses. But before I get to those questions, perhaps maybe to start out by saying something very briefly about two particular issues that I think are relevant and I think colleague, my colleague before me uh, has raised. Uh, and I'm sure others will as well. And that is the first two issues. The first one being the classroom. Uh, certainly, you know, we've transitioned as most of us have uh, without much choice into a virtual space, but nevertheless, a classroom and what is its meaning in this broader context? And secondly, I will turn to say something a little bit about theory, but then return to the core questions. I don't think what I'm saying is profound, but it has relevance and bearing, I think, on some of the issues. Perhaps maybe to start by saying that, you know, we cannot simply conceptualize the classroom as a space where the teacher is either shaping young minds or preaching to the already converted. In many ways, I mean, I think that that assumptions are constantly changing and it should. Uh, and, and just building on again, I think, you know, the point I'm making here is the personal lived experiences, the context, uh, uh, the location, the positions which we've just heard of students, including ourselves, have made their way into academic practice and processes. And I think these need to be at the heart and lung of uh, debates around making theory more accessible, understandable, appealing in several ways. I'll come back to that notion of making theory appealing. Um, and so, you know, the world of social theory is being taught in, uh, in a context of deep complexity and contestation particularly issues uh, you know, around identity markers that shape who we are in, in a classroom. A classroom is certainly not a neutral space. Uh, and I think those are very important issues. So we're all coming, we're all students, whether teachers or you know, the students who we are conveying information to, we're coming from a variety of social positions, uh, but also from a variety of digital, and I think also print standpoints that have an impact in the way the news and the world out there is shaping thinking. And, and so learning is important. I mean, this is also influencing the stuff uh, that we teach, uh, but also unlearning is quite critical. And I think that's where theory plays a part. 
challenging assumptions, probing the implications of what we say. Uh, so theory has a particular utility, if that's a message that I wanted to get across as well. So turning to that second point around theory, uh, for me, uh, teaching it, and I'm sure colleagues in this virtual space here, will recognize that theory often creates anxieties and resistance uh, amongst our students, sometimes also us, but, but very often with our students, and I don't mean to be paternalistic. It's often much to do with the density of the readings, the abstraction, the grammar, the jargon. Uh, and, and our task is often to navigate as teachers uh, the concepts, the vocabulary, the fields of ideas, uh, the thought, without in any way trying to dilute, uh, but in, in many ways making students see the uses, the value, the relevance in a social world. I said earlier that, you know, experience is quite critical. And I think, you know, self-reflection is quite critical. I've always been influenced by Louis Altus's ideas around self-criticism, particularly also as it relates to the teaching project around uh, the transformative approach to, to teaching and recognizing that the ability to cultivate students' ability to question, deconstruct, and reconstruct their ideas is not only part of the learning project, but it is really an attribute in so many ways. I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but really to say I've also been influenced in thinking about, you know, the core academic content, uh, drawing on Basil Bernstein's work, the sociologist of education, particularly in, in, in thinking about the, in, in the domains in which pedagogic discourse operates, and I'll come to that in a second, the idea of production. Uh, the site where new knowledge is created, but also very importantly for us in this debate is also the, the, the field of recontextualization. In other words, how we rearrange, select and transform the stuff into curricula, but canon debate is central to this. And perhaps more importantly, thirdly, is, is reproduction in the sites of teaching and, and learning. And, 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 and that tension is quite rife in our classrooms uh, and the debates because the field of uh, of recontextualization uh, opens up conflict and struggle uh, for dominance, particularly also as the decolonial turn teaches us uh, the broader curriculum, uh, curriculum reform debates around being polyphonic, uh, recognizing other diversities, uh, other epistemological uh, knowledge fields, if you like, and voice, which is important. And I think sociology is not immune to that. I mean, the debate around canons is quite critical here. Uh, and sociology may be a global discipline, but it is not a universal one, uh, as there are various voices that have something to say that are often not featured. I think my colleagues have already alluded to that. I won't say too much, but the canon debate is alive and well and necessary because canons are complex creatures uh, that constantly in, require our engagement as teachers and including students. I've also been influenced, you know, in thinking about this, uh, particularly with the work of the Indiana sociologist, uh, Fabio Rojas, uh, in his classic book, Theory for Working Sociologists, in thinking about moving purely from focusing on intellectual histories of critical thinkers to bigger questions of social problems. In other words, that, uh, in a way, focus on how theories help connect cause to outcome in the social world. And I think that's that's quite critical uh, in thinking of uh, the course and the way it has been designed. So turning to the first question, Bernard, that you've asked around what is it should be covered in the sociology theory class? Well, in my case, I mean, it's a 13-week course. It's a titled Social Theory and Contemporary Debates. It's designed to introduce students. Of course, the idea of being comprehensive is a misnomer because you cannot, as colleagues have been saying, uh, you know, you know, be completely representative uh, in, in with time limits and so forth. But what we do is try to focus on a deeper understanding of a selection of modern and contemporary social theorists, looking at conceptual tools, looking at genealogies, uh, of theoretical approaches. Uh, but really, it's a broad sweep. But looking at primary texts, I'll come to that in a second, but also secondary readings too, uh, and looking at orientations, but really also striking a somewhat of a balance. I mean, that's a bit of a misnomer between the classical and contemporary social theory, particularly the focus on debates. So it's a seminar, research-driven, uh, conversational course 
uh, where the lecturer is not a dominant voice, but a facilitator in some ways. If I turn to your second question, how do we position our teaching in relation to 19th and early 20th century classical theory canon? Well, we cannot escape the canon, at least that's my view. But how we engage the canon, I think, is where the challenge is. Uh, the canon is ambiguous, it is discursive, it's always under construction, it's unfinished business, frankly. Uh, and the question for me, in terms of thinking pedagogically, is how do we read the text against the grain of current histories? For example, if half my course, six of the seminars, focus on, call it, the canonical thinkers, uh, for want of a better word, Marx certainly features. Of course, we read the primary text, volume one of Capital and the Communist Manifesto, Durkheim, Rules of Sociological Method and Suicide, Weber, Three Types of Legitimate Rule and Sociological Concepts, Foucault, Discipline and Punish, but of, co but of course, other texts such as the History of Sexuality and Power Knowledge, and Giddens, where I focus on the Constitution of society and the outline of the theory of structuration. I mean, the structure agency debate is a conundrum we all know as sociologists that features in an ongoing way. The second half of the course really gets to the heart of social problems against contemporary theorists. And we can discuss that in discussion sessions, you know, topics such as globalization, social movements, citizenship, land, class, capital, nationalism, decoloniality, race and racism, crime and society, gendered feminisms, identity politics, sexuality, violence, biopolitics, the sociology of human consciousness, uh, the sociology of inequalities, which is important. And a, a thematic I introduced this year is a sociology of COVID-19, not because it's current, but also there's great room for thinking theoretically about it. The third issue you ask is what is the practice of teaching theory oriented towards? I mean, I can talk a little more about that. I, I'm of the view that theory is not about application. I'm sure colleagues exist, but it's really about uh, sometimes students think, you know, it's a template that you provide and then you fill in the blanks. Uh, but it really is looking at the diversity of options in terms of what theory does and thinking about society, uh, ideas about how societies change and develop that exactly as my colleague before me has said, the theory you know, arises from everyday life. It doesn't fall from the sky. I try to get across to students that theory does not resolve the disputes. It doesn't create solution. It raises agendas. And that I think is important. And, and really to, uh, to think about our paradigms, our values, and ask critical questions about that. I use a classical paper that Gabriel Abend used, uh, wrote a paper titled The Meaning of Theory in Sociological Theory 2008, which I find really useful, complex, dense, but it challenges students to think about the propositions. The fourth issue is the balance between the encyclopedic knowledge of theory and close reading of text. You know, here too, I must say there is never a fine balance. I must be quite honest about that. It's pretty much like the Rohinton mystery novel of the same title. Uh, close reading, I think, is critical. But as my colleague says, it's impossible to do it, you know, in great depth in a class. But students are encouraged to work with passages, to debate it, to analyze it in a way. The fifth issue about teaching theory in the original or in textbooks. I must say I'm skeptical about teaching theory only via summative texts. I really resist that idea, not because I want to punish students, but I think it is absolutely essential. Uh, I'm of the firm view, view that we need a mix. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect a literary student to uh, uh, read a commentary on a novel without actually reading a novel itself. And I think, therefore, it is important for, to expose our students to the primary readings in a way that enables them to, uh, to be troubled by the text, even if the grammar and the density is quite uh, complex. The sixth issue, finally, and I will end here, is the kinds of modes of assessing theory uh, that are most appropriate. You know, it's, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, uh, you know, up until last year, uh, I used to end the course with a formal examination. And I, I, I must say, I'm quite anti-examinations, if I could put it that way. I, I really like the idea of continuous assessment, especially in theory, where you, know, you progressively move students from shorter writing exercises that you review, uh, that you get them grapple with a text, you provide feedback, and that com 
comprises part of the, the mark. Uh, students have an e-reflection, really a response paper to a particular reading. Class participation is critical and how that is generated, uh, whether you know in a seminar led by the lecturer, but also students themselves participating, leading seminars against big topics. And then, of course, you know, big issues in, in, in academic work is writing, expressing yourself in arguments. And that is, you know, shaped by two formative essays, one short, one a lengthy paper, uh, which is research driven, where there's self-study, primary texts, uh, et cetera, that I review and provide advice. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a take home test that that students receive. In many ways, I think it's quite uh, comprehensive in terms of engaging students to think, but really there's no resolution or solution. It's not my view that students have to become experts in social theory, but really the, it, it, it stimulates their thinking uh, as to the relevance of theory in, in, in what they do, in, in, in not only in social theory, but in, in other courses, whether it's sociology or just general thinking uh, about their location and position in the world. Chair, I think I will stop there for now, um, because I think I might have used up my time as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Again, uh, spot on. So thank you for being so punctual. Um, I now would like to invite um, Dr. Faisal Garba from uh, UCT Sociology to, to take the floor. Uh, hi, um, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Uh, can you see me? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bernard, for, for the invitation. I am really happy to be able to learn and, and, and share lessons on uh, teaching theory across uh, institutions. Um, my name is Faisal, as Shahid said. I um, teach theory at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels um, at UCT. At the undergraduate level, I teach a second year course called Social Theory, and at the postgraduate level, I teach a combined honors and master's course called Contemporary Social Theory. Um, now, I think theory in a South African context, uh, which as Bernard says, um, has a legacy of um, racializing, but also exclusionary practices in knowledge production, uh, but also a context uh, which in the same vein has a very particular ordering relationship with other parts of the world that it has very close knowledge experiences. And here I refer to the rest of the continent. So these uh, uh, two context specific issues guide the way I think. Now, in, in, in asking uh, uh, myself the question that Bernard throws to us, which is the how, I, I thought of some guiding principles that drive what I do. Um, the first really is comparative and relational thinking um, with, but also to other places, issues and times. So for example, how can one understand the question of identity in South Africa um, relative to the issues of the incorporation, say, of peasants in, 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 in revolutionary uh, uh, France, for example. Um, locating synergies and divergences between immediate circumstances and others, meaning other places, other traditions, but also other times, so that students are able to think uh, of issues in their surrounding as it relates to other places, but also to be able to think of what is peculiar and try to explain those. Uh, placing social thought in context without being trapped by place or time, here the idea really is to go through nodal historical moments that inform the way thinking has emerged theoretically, but also debates. And so here, what we try to do in the courses is to say, if one wants to think of, say, uh, uh, ideas around the emergence of capital, you know, that uh, 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 Marx developed after having uh, tried to deal with very concrete issues in the expansion of monopoly capital in Europe, how can one think of that moment in Europe in relation to capital accumulation in South Africa today, right, without 
allowing the very historical moment in Germany to overdetermine the way we think of present day South Africa, but also by contextualizing what happened in Germany. Uh, recognizing connections in thinking while aware of the reality of the history of narrowness in thinking that has produced a very limited and limiting canon, where theory in particular is said to come from certain places where application should happen elsewhere. And I think Bernard makes this point that there's a particular history that we have inherited, that theory is supposed to come from you know, certain places and others have to apply uh, 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 this. So here, in other to get students to be aware of this history, but also for them to understand how to think this history in context, I rely on a very short text by Kwesi Uredu called Conceptual Decolonization, where concepts as the building blocks of theory are taken seriously. Each concept is taken seriously, you historicize it and see how relevant it is to the issue that you are dealing with. And finally, enabling students to think critically of their research in the context of processes elsewhere, using their research to develop knowledge and inform the elsewhere. So here really the idea is to say, how can a student think critically about what they are doing? So if you take a postgraduate student, how can they think critically about a topic, but also locate that topic in experiences that are cognate or different, while at the same time helping in, in, in broadening the scope of, of, of abstract thinking. I think this is important here because often when students write proposals and they come to that you know, section on theoretical framework, there's a mechanical reduction of what is presumed to be the, 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 the outlines of a theory and then you say, well, does this match here? Instead of a critical reflection on what has been written and how relevant or irrelevant it is to what one is looking at. So now the question of the what, I'll try to do um, this by um, briefly going through two courses that I teach, the undergraduate and postgraduate levels uh, um, courses on theory, and to try and think through the question that Bernard asked. So the first question, so how does one think theory in contemporary South Africa? So if you think of the social theory course that, that I teach, I teach it with a colleague called um, Ruchi Chaturvedi, what we are concerned with really is to introduce students to a range of philosophical and social ideas um, that inform thinking around social structure, political debates, and social change. So in the first part of the course, um, we introduce students to theoretical thinking through reflections on social development in Africa, meaning we look at how particular social institutions, social structures have shifted over time while in the process thematizing certain key issues. So class and gender inequality, power and privilege, race and ethnicity, state democracy, violence and corruption, colonialism and domination, decolonization and its limits, and the nature of knowledge. In the second part, we then look at modernity from its antecedents to its definitions, to anti-colonial movements and critiques and, and post-colonial reflections. So what exactly do we teach? So I, for example, do the first part of the course, and this is what we begin with. We ask the question, what is social theory? You know, so why are we doing theory? In order to understand that, one has to then be clear upfront about the limits of comparison because theory essentially is an attempt you know to think the immediate relative to, to 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 something else which might also be immediate or distant and here we we read that text by harrington you know introduction to social theory i'm sure we all know that that text what is social theory in the second week we then go to theory and knowledge um, before last year i give the students hegel in the original so bernard refers to the, the history of philosophy uh, and that portion in particular where Hegel gives Africa a short shrift. So the idea really is to think of how Hegel emerges theoretically at his conclusions, but also to engage with the subsequent understandings of society, either agreeing or disagreeing with Hegel. And so Kuchendahl's 
piece on evaluating or evaluation of the treatment of, of Africa in the philosophy of history uh, tries to, to locate Hegel historically, but also to think through the categories that Hegel uses in arriving at his conclusions. And in week three, we do debates on theory. And here we, we, we use two texts, basically. The first is the Scholars, Inc. Uh, by, by uh, Suleiman Bashir Jan, uh, which is trying to do a different history of not just theoretical thinking, but abstract reflection. So the idea of Europe as self-contained, you know, as uh, an entity which emerged uh, outside of uh, interactions with the rest of the world is disrupted to show how at a certain point in time, uh, people simply moved to wherever they could learn. And knowledge was never ascribed to a place. Knowledge was not rooted in a place. Knowledge was seen as something that people learn and improve upon. And in order to also show the limits of academic thinking, we then look at a very short text by Aziz Chowdhury called The Intellectual Labor of Social Movements, where the limits of the categories that have been valorized as you know, constituting uh, social theory is made visible by alternative ways in which people produce knowledge within the context of struggle. And I think this is important because it raises question about the efficacy of the frames that we use, especially in the decolonial moment, to say what exactly is this decolonization outside of a broader engagement of what knowledge is uh, 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 at, at, at the, the margins of, of systematic uh, abstraction. In the fourth week, we look at power, social control, and resistance, and you know that famous text by 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 Lila Abulogud on the romance of resistance. And I think it continues along this trajectory of showing not just the limits of of, of you know valorized ways of knowing, but also the limits of some of what we may consider as resistant or or counter uh, uh, movements in 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 in, in thinking. Uh, you know, that this, this text is based on a particular Bedouin society uh, straddling Egypt and Algeria. And we find we look at the public sphere uh, in Africa, state and democracy, and I'm sure everybody is familiar with that short text by, by Peter A.K. Colonialism and, 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 and the two public spheres, a theoretical statement, you know, where the origins of the public sphere uh, uh, as it emerged in Europe, developed by, 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 by Habermas in a certain way, you know, has a different history and therefore would have to point to a different uh, theoretical uh, 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 way of thinking if one were to locate it in Africa. So the attempt here is not so much to think in terms of uniqueness or, or specificity, but is to think in terms of emergence and how particular historical processes that are linked give rise to different ways in which people function in the public sphere. And in the final week, we look at democracy from below in Africa, a text by Isa Shivji called The Struggle for Democracy. And in doing all this, the idea is to locate the texts and the issues that we are looking at in very immediate local uh, 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 context. So for example, when we're talking about colonialism and uh, the, the public sphere, state and democracy, the tutorial question uh, for that week um, tries to get students to think of what is called state capture. And last year, we looked at the, the question of corruption around uh, 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 PPEs and think of that in relationship to what AK was talking about in, in, in Nigeria, but also what Habermas was thinking about the public sphere in, 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 in Europe historically. Now, I'll spend the last um, uh, minutes that I have uh, to, to talk about the, the master's course, Contemporary Social Theory, and what we, we, we seek to do in that course. Um, the idea really is to invite students to think the immediate, geographically and socially, in a way that is reflecting of experiences and social structures elsewhere. And I think this is really important, this comparative thinking, because really, at the core of theory, you know, it's, it's this attempt to think here and the there. So how do we do that within the context of present day issues? So the first, again, is we look at um, a text by Manuela Boatka, who is um, a Romanian sociologist based in Freiburg, uh, who tries to understand global inequality uh, going beyond Marx and Weber, okay? And drawing from the experiences of, of, of Eastern Europe and Latin America. Now, this is an important text because in a way it shows 
uh, the contingency of localized inequality, but also show how processes that are transnational, you know, uh, 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 shape the way in which thinking happens in very local places. Um, in, the, in the second week, we look at the limits of binary in knowledge production, um, <clears throat> where we, 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 we concentrate on a debate between Amsele and uh, Suleiman Bashirjan. You know, um, they published a book together, uh, which, which is really about debating the universal. You know, what is the universal? Is there something called the universal? Is it a collation of uh, specific local realities? Or it's about thinking through particular themes, particular questions across across place. The idea here again is to equip students with a certain critical instincts, you know, that enable them to understand not just the limits of theorizing, but to see theory in everyday experiences and how these shape choices that people make in life. In the third week, we look at um, empire, past and present, and and you know the text by 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 um, Goethe, world making after empire, and in particular uh, that section which is um, focused on the idea of decolonization as a central pillar through which people thought of the universal. And that for, for, for me is important because most of the students in the class um, last year were very animated by the question of decolonization. And so, so thinking through decolonization historically, its limits as um, formulated in the debates is something that, that was very useful, useful for us. <clears throat> And then we, we, we look at um, the question of identity and, and, and belonging and, and, and how um, that has uh, uh, emerged in, um, across uh, place and time. Now, I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time, but I will try to, to focus on a few issues that Bernard raised in his introduction. So the question of what do you do with the canons? You know, do you just sideline them and replace them with an alternative canon? or you engage the canon in context, you engage the canon as obvious says intertextually. The approach that I take in my courses is to say, what exactly are the set of issues that we want to look at? And how do we draw on resources that enable students to think as globally as possible in order to make sense of that which is immediate? So here, this guides you know, the way in which we relate to the canon. So it's not to say we, we do away with the canon, it's to read those aspects of the canon that are useful with a very critical spirit. A critical spirit that is extended to the counter canons that we use. So that the focus here is not substitution, but it's about a set of skills and a set of aptitude that, 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 that a student should, 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 should develop in, in, in relating to text, while not being uh, for a second, while not suspending the historical reality which continue to shape the present, that knowledges from certain parts of the world, knowledges that address certain issues, are often made marginal. So in, in correcting this, well, not correcting, but in trying to undo this process, how does one think critically, especially around the canons? And here that point about um, uh, uh, the Scholars Inc., the text by, by Suleiman Bashir is important because one disrupts the self-image. And here, the text is based on philosophy, but I think it applies to social theory generally. One disrupts the self-image of, of, of thought as something which is linear, which came from a particular place, and, and therefore uh, uh, something that belongs to a certain part of the world that excludes other people. Uh, instead, the idea is to, to do a history of the emergence of this idea, this thing called European knowledge, European theory. You know, and, 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 and we do this by, by, by contextualizing uh, the immediate in, in history and, and in relation to, to other places. So I think I will, I will stop here uh, for the next speaker. I think the focus for me really is, is, is the, 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 the engagement um, afterwards. Thank you very much. OK, great. Thank you, Faisal. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for wrapping up. Um, I'd like to now invite our last speaker, Professor Alvis Arabe to come forward. I'm going to spotlight you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I thank you to Bernard. I think this is a great initiative. Um, it is a discussion that is very 
opportun it's a very opportune time for us at um, UWC because we are actually busy recalculating and we're all thinking through specifically the relationship or theory with, with other elements. So it's a good time for us to have this discussion. Um, before I start, I would just like to make one observation and I hope during the discussion time we will get to that as well. I find if I look around, it seems to me that in at most universities that the teaching of theory module in particular um, is dominated by men. And I wonder why that is the case. Perhaps I'm wrong. Um, perhaps it's not the case. It's just the universities that I happen to know about where it is the case. But I'm wondering why there are not more women who are actually teaching theory at universities. That's one thing that I would like to say at the beginning. Another thing that I would like to say, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with this idea that we have um, this focus on theory modules and then we we don't talk about what do we do with theory in other modules. I mean, if you if you do teach any sociological module, regardless of the contents, you are going to bring theory into that. And I think when we have these discussions, we should just bear that in mind because we are focusing very much on those modules that now have the name theory in it. Um, but that's not where we limit ourselves when we talk about theory. And I think it's important that we have these links also so that students can understand the links between theory and research and, and, and how it relates to very specific things. Um, UWC had a lot of um, changes in terms of personnel staff in the last few years. So because of that, I'm now quite fortunate that I could look at what other people did for other sociologists on different levels. Um, and it's interesting to me how some of us think very similar and we come to the same conclusions, but not necessarily in the way that other people have presented it here today. Um, the first uh, speaker, obvious, I think I've also already mentioned it, but I think um, all of them have alluded to that. We have limited time, so we have to be realistic in what can we expect from, from students. At UWC, we have a second year module that is specifically called classical theory. Um, we've got then a third year module that is called contemporary theory and then uh, honors module, which I'm teaching this year, um, which is also called contemporary theory. So it's already divided in that particular way. Um, but we start off with theory already in the first year, um, of course, and there was a very long history at UWC to, to incorporate and start with the idea of sociological imagination with the students and then work towards the classical three branches of theory, if you like, um, and then carry on from there. At the moment, the, the, the first year um, modules are being developed almost as we speak, but there is a, we, we do use some textbooks there, not one textbook, but extracts from different textbooks. But on the second year level, when we now, now start with classical theory, um, there's definitely then an approach to, to introduce the students to, to extracts from, from readings in particular places. The current, the current um, lecturer of the second year, um, I don't know if he's here today, Mitchell Hunter, is doing it in a very interesting way, in my view, where the first term where he speaks of classical theorists, he looks at classical theorists from the north and he includes the, of course, Durkheim, Weber and Marx, but also people like Du Bois and Ida Wells. So he, he, he puts it from the global north. And then in the second term, he has South African theorist, um, and he includes the Bernard Mokambane, Saul Bloike, Oshimad Feji, and Charlotte Matcheke. Um, I just wanted to say, I taught this last year, and I think it's important when you, when you teach someone like Durkheim, and I have done it, and, and he's also doing it, is first of all, you have to make it very clear to students to, to think of it within a geographical and historical context. But what I have done with Durkheim in particular is I've, I've found um, articles, recent articles written within the last five years that are using the ideas of Durkheim in research. So for example, there was an arti article on um, the zombie apocalypse um, using the ideas of, of Durkheim and on suicide and, and linking that to, to popular media, basically. And I think that is a useful thing to do for students so that they understand that, yes, it was developed within a particular time period, but elements of that may still be applicable and elements of that can also be applied in a very new context. Um, so, but when we introduce 
the so-called classical canon and so on, for me it's just very important that they understand the historical context and, and, and the geographical context. I think some students are sometimes limited with they think of South Africa and Europe, and it's as if they leave out the rest of the world. So it's also to broaden their thinking around different aspects or different dynamics in um, different ge geographical um, contexts. So in the third year, um, as I say, we, we are changing quite a bit at the moment on what we are focusing on, but there are some similarities. We, we focus on, on themes and um, some of the themes that at the moment is overlapping, but obviously I won't repeat it in next year for this particular group of students who are now in the third year, um, is, is discussions on something like public sociology, but specifically to understand um, discussions between the global north and the global south and how a term that was used by a person from, from the global north, um, but from South Africa and how South Africans have reacted towards this, but also how a person from Latin America has reacted towards this. So to open up this discussion to understand where does South African sociology sit within the wider um, world of, of, of theory today, not only theory, but also in, in what we actually do. Um, so to make it alive for students, so that they don't only see theory as, as, as something that is a theoretical discussion only, but it's more than that. It's also about how do you approach um, research, what kind of ideas do you have when you engage with society and so forth. Um, there are, of course, texts that we use specifically focusing on decolonizing and so forth. Um, I, in the honours, actually start on, on theme work. Um, and the theme that I've chosen is social capital. I've chosen this specifically because I've marked or I examined quite a few MI students in the past in South Africa from different universities where people, students are not necessarily able to engage deeply with theory in, 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 their, in their own dissertations. It's as if they have a quick discussion at the beginning and, and, and almost forget about it. Of course, this is not universal, but it, it often happens. And to make students aware that the, if you if you take a particular theme, that there are very different views on how that particular theoretical concept plays out, um, and then also focus on, for example, Dirk Calderblom was written um, an article in 2018 on social capital, how it can be linked to issues that we have in South Africa, but also to make it a little bit broader, to look at someone like Alejandro Portes, who is looking at it more on a national level, but the whole idea is that it, it, it doesn't matter that you have to cover everything in the world. If you take one theme, it can be any theme, and the students understand that there's a body of literature that has developed around that theme, and that it's not um, only a question of having a few quotes from a person when you're going to use it within research, but that you actually engage deeply with these different um, approaches to it, but also see that there's a development of a theme over time. And it is from different parts in the world as well that it has that it has that it's happened. So this is sort of what we are aiming for when we are busy with um, with this particular theme. One of the uh, the themes that I have decided that I will introduce and that I'm going to probably keep for a very long time in the honors course is um, the term Ubuntu. Particularly, again, I found that many students on different levels when they write assignments or in the right essays or anything like that. They are very critical of um, theory that comes from the North um, or from North America. But then they almost have this idea, but if we have Ubuntu, everything will be fine. And there was not much critical evaluation of that. So I borrow a bit from, from the philosophers in, in starting off this discussion. Uh, people like Ramosi in particular, also because he wrote a little bit about Ubuntu and the environment, and that is one of the streams that we want to develop now, um, or that we are busy developing. So, But also Simon Mapadi Ming wrote a few years back um, an article where he tried to use, or he used the term Ubuntu within a particular research um, setting. So to use a term to show how one can look at, um, at the term theoretically, but then also see how it plays out. So that's one of the types of things that we do when we talk about the what. Just maybe to come back on the issue that I had on that it theory is not, um, theory is linked to other areas as well. So another um, 
module that I teach on the second year is sociology of crime and violence, and they are used um, very in elementary texts by Giddens showing how classical approaches to theory can be applied to crime and violence, but then take it further and um, show how there are more um, critical texts from the global south um, with the underlying approach of the conflict theory of a Marxist approach, but how it now plays out in, in this particular um, area of, of research. And also then to make comparisons perhaps between um, South Africa and Latin American countries, particularly Brazil, about the militarization around um, around crime and violence and that, 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 that um, accompanies that. To also make students aware that if you are using theory, um, it plays out in a particular way in this context, but also perhaps in another context where there are similarities, but also differences. And this is just to underline my previous point that I don't like the idea that we only think of theory as if it is something pristine that is happening in those particular modules that are called theory. It happens in all the modules. And I think it, when we are now thinking about our syllabus and how we want to um, grow it from the first year until a student is finished with the honors, how the different linkages um, between the modules, how they play out, we don't only focus on the theory itself, but also how it um, links to sociology of health, to social inequality and, and the other modules that we have on the undergraduate level. So um, in terms of, so that is sort of what I wanted to say on the what. Um, we have a lot of changes at the moment. And when I think of what I've taught last year for this particular module on the honors, it's quite different from what I'm teaching this year. And it's also been, will be quite different from what I'm going to teach next year, because I'm trying to track the students and see what did they do at UWC on the second and the third year in the theory modules, and then see what gaps they possibly um, were that I would like to augment in some way. Um, but having said that, um, to come back to, just to come back to some of Bernard's questions on, on the how, um, we have also quite moved away from the idea, um, Vasu really has also indicated, of, of sit-down exams. Um, we have, in the honours that I have at the moment, I try to have different types of assessment. So they have a group project where um, they are put in different groups and they look at texts from different um, authors or, or, or full, full um, books from different authors and then they have to present that as a group um, and also related to that is the idea of peer review. I think it's important that students are exposed to peer review quite early on in their career. A lot of young scholars, for example, when they struggle to publish their first paper or their first article, um, you find that if they are given an opportunity to review someone else's, that they are actually good at reviewing someone else's theory better than they are at review or someone else's paper, sorry, than they are at reviewing their own work. And I think the skill of, of thinking through what does it mean when you actually review someone else's work helps them, them to write better themselves. So that's one of the things that I try to build into the theory um, module as well in assessment. Um, obviously, there's a large chunk of class participation. So if we have discussed any of the work that they have prepared beforehand, obviously they have to come to class being prepared, having read the text that have been prescribed. Um, they have also, they have to um, write short um, reflections on what we have discussed um, on, on online. So it's, it's part of the class participation. And then we have a larger individual essay where they can, um, what we do in the course is we read widely. Um, so let's say we take social capital, so it's a wide reading of social capital where we have a few articles on that. But then if you choose that as your individual essay, then you're going to choose, then you have to read more deeply and, and, and go through the text again. But you can choose which particular um, topic that we have covered you want to, you, to do your individual essay on. And the same then with the final um, so, or the final assessment, um, we don't have an exam in, in the usual sense of, of remembering stuff, but rather an, an assignment, uh, take home assignment. And again, when you do the take home assignment, it's not only to write what did the people say about this, what did other theorists say about that, it's to think critically around the particular topic, see how different people approach the topic, but then always I ask them to link it up with actual research. 
if it is if it is um, possible, but in all cases it actually is. Um, so that you can see also, but if this topic is being talked about in this manner, how does it actually then play out in research? So perhaps it's, all, I think, it, not perhaps, it is definitely part of my approach as well, where I like to see theory um, within an empirical context. Um, otherwise, it becomes for me more a matter of philosophy. Not that I'm saying I'm not introducing texts that comes that that are more um, abstract and not so directly related to theory. But in the end, for me, it is also a preparation to to get honest students to that level that when they do their own research essay and when they are going to continue with a master's degree, that they are ready to actually employ the theory into that. Um, perhaps coming back to the idea of why. There are not so many women. It is interesting because I think if I have to choose a topic where the linkages between European thinking, North American thinking, and what happened in the rest of the world come together the best are actually within feminist theory. Um, because feminists to me are sometimes, and, and let me just say at first, I'm not a feminist scholar myself. I am obviously a feminist, but I'm not a feminist scholar. But when I look at the canon um, of feminist work, it is actually amazing how the different um, relationships between what happens in the broader Africa, what happens in South Africa, how it links up with with, with um, practical um, um, matters, um, how all of this come together. So for me, um, we now use at the moment intersectionality theory, but for example, next year, I think I would rather look at um, the new book by Sylvia Tamale on decolonization and Africa and Afrofeminism, um, because it it just lends itself much easier to understand the different links between it. Um, if we speak about something like intersectionality as well, um, which has originated amongst um, many African American scholars, but how they linked up with Latin scholars, and again how it played out differently in 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 Europe, but also how it's being applied in South Africa and other parts of Africa. So there are very nice examples of, of, of how it can happen within feminist theory that I find very useful if I have to introduce students on understanding the different linkages of um, how things have developed originally um, in different contexts at the same time, but also during different times, and also how does decolonization, um, Africanization, and other elements play into that. So I think those are the kinds of things that I can say for now. I may, perhaps I should stop so we have more time for discussion. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you so much, Marius, for, um, for that talk and for wrapping up. Um, I'd like to now, um, of course, um, and, and now open the, uh, open the floor to some questions. In the interest of time, um, I will gather a few questions, hopefully up to five or six questions, which I will then open up to the panel who um, will have some time to respond. Um, so please, um, yeah, so please raise your hand if you um, if you have a question and then I can call on you. Um, and yeah, so, okay, so let me start with um, Simone, Professor Simone Becker from, uh, from our department. Thank you, Shahid. I, I have a very short question for each one of the four presenters whose presentations were really very interesting. The question is the following. Does the notion or the idea of the empirical belong in social theory courses? Also, how the empirical influences theory construction over time, which appears to me important. Thank you. OK, so. Stephen. Hi, um, thanks very, very much. Really interesting questions. I, I'm just wanting to ask whether, you know, issues around Anthropocene, Capitalocene, um, et cetera, are entering into theory courses. Because um, when one talks of Marx, one could equally be talking about um, Marxist readings that really address those questions, such as Jason Moore and Chakrabarti, for example, who's just come out with a reworking of an earlier paper called The Climate of History. So I'm just curious to what, sorry, uh, to what degree um, 
you know that that's and then on top of that you have people such as uh, um, Verges, um, Francois Verges writing about the black anthropocene, you know, so dealing with uh, racial capitalism and she calls it the anth the anthropocene, the racial anthropocene is a, a term she uses. Anyway, so I'm curious whether that is being addressed. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I'll just keep it short and simple. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, next we have Carla. Carla. Yes, hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so in our theory class, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, kind of knowledge that falls a bit outside of social theory, so like history and politics. And it seems like um, it seems like also in a lot of what has been said is that that's kind of thinking, you know, social theory through time and space and so like historical knowledge comes into that I'm just interested in how um the the, the people who have spoken have um yeah how they address maybe uh, a lack of not of historical knowledge in their students yeah if that makes sense Okay, thank you. So we don't seem to have any more hands right now. So unless somebody comes forth, um, I'm happy to open the. Oh, let's see. Oh, we have one more. Um, um, I don't know your name, but Williams. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can okay. hear you, Katie. Yes. Uh, it's Lauren. Um, I'm actually I'm one of Bernard's tutors for um sociological theory third year, and um, it's, I don't know if I I don't want to force it into a question, but I just wanted to say that on um Marilisa's um speech, uh, what she said about the uh, drawing examples from um the everyday life um in sociological theory. I recently had an experience in a, a tutorial um, class where uh, one student made this really brilliant example of uh, Love Island, and then she connected it to um, uh, Goffman's notion of total institutions, and the whole class immediately just lit up and started engaging and thinking about the definition, and then they, they just got excited about it, and I, and I think that's so... It was just amazing, and I think more of that in social theory teaching would be brilliant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think let's invite the I will invite the um, speakers to uh, to respond, um, perhaps in the order in which they were um, in, in which they were listed on the panel. Um, so, Bernard, would you like to start? Sure, uh, and I should say um, thank you to everybody. I, I think they've been very carefully considered and very interesting and provocative presentations. Um, so um, even if we, even if the discussion doesn't uh, yeah, I mean the discussion doesn't conclude here. I think it. I think there's lots to say. Um, um, I do feel like uh, you know, given that that this is a Stellenbosch event and I'm at Stellenbosch, uh, perhaps uh, I shouldn't take too long in my responses. Um, certainly, I think uh, so. I could be very brief and then give other people the floor. Um, um, Simon, I think I think the question of uh, for me at least. Uh, I understand theory as, as asking about the conditions of possibility of empirical knowledge. Uh, what kinds of empirical knowledge become possible at different times? Uh, and theory is really trying to engage that, um, both in a more contemporary way and in a more historical way. Um, but obviously, I think, and, and this ties in with Lauren, I think uh, the extent to which one can give empirical examples, the extent to which one can ground, um, can ground theoretical insight in in contemporary examples is absolutely 
important in 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 uh, in the transmission of of theory. I, I I do think that there's a real value to thinking in abstract abstract ways, but um, but the the accessibility of theory to some extent is dependent on the capacity to to ground that theory in in contemporary contexts, um, especially at undergraduate level. Um, I think uh, I think uh, Stephen uh, uh, the the issue of the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene uh, uh, I believe it deserves more attention. Um, I think um, in different departments I'm interested to see how how it's treated and 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 the extent to which it features in theory. Uh, it's certainly emergent in in different places as you suggest. Uh, and Carla, I think. I think it's a serious question. To what extent does pre, does does theory presuppose a set of historical knowledges, whether uh, whether global historical knowledges, historical knowledges of Europe, or historical knowledges of elsewhere, uh, and um, you know the the way in which theory sort of hinges on certain certain historical events to me seems fundamental. Um, and the capacity of students to engage those theories depends to some extent on their knowledge of that. Um, but I'm again curious uh, as to what my colleagues elsewhere think. So thank you. Thanks again, everybody. I think it was a, it's been a really, really engaging set of presentations. Great. Thanks, Bernard. Um, obvious. Uh, can I invite you to come forward? Yes. <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for, for, for this platform and uh, for, 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 for this conversation. Uh, yeah, the questions are spot on, and I think it's a call for us to, you know, to think more carefully about the uses of theory and, uh, you know, how to transmit theory, how to teach theory, and, uh, and so on. Now, I would, I would start with uh, some, uh, Simon's uh, question about the importance of the empirical in theory. Uh, yeah, I would just want to refer us to a statement made by Boju uh, that uh, theory is only significant to the to the degree that uh, it is put to work empirically. I mean, he tries to push us to desist, desist from thinking of uh, theories divorced from the empirical. You know, the two are interconnected. Really, you can't <laughs> think of theory uh, simply without also thinking about, uh, you know, the empirical, according to Boju. So I think our attempt even in teaching theory is uh, probably better off guided by this approach of putting it to work Empirical, uh, and I, I agree with what uh, you know. Bernard has said, you know, that theory is always asking us of the condition of impos of, of possibility. Right, uh, Robin's question. I think there was a bit of a break, you know, when when, when you spoke. So I just said about the the black uh, anthropocene. I didn't really hear the other part of the question. So maybe because of that, I'm a bit handicapped, you know. Uh, to respond to, to that question. Uh, so maybe I will leave my other colleagues who understood the question to, to respond. Uh, Kron's question, knowledge falling outside of sociological theory. Uh, yeah, I believe in, in thinking much more broadly and establishing connections between sociological theory and uh, what we can broadly call social theory. Of course, that would in, you know, in, in incorporate you know, history, politics, uh, anthropology, and other other. Uh, other cognitive disciplines, yeah, or even you know beyond beyond this this social science disciplines, to think also with uh, literature, etc. So I think that is very very important. And uh, you, you asked the question of how you address the lack of historical knowledge in the students. Uh, yeah, historical knowledge is very key. I mean, sociology you know is very much also historical in its in its approaches. So I think when you teach sociological theory, we should always bear in mind that we are also teaching history. To some extent, or that we are teaching historical sociology. Drawing examples from everyday life, I think that connects to what I've already said about putting theory, you know, to work empirically. In other words, we look at theory, uh, if we follow this Bodusian way of thinking, we look at theory as, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as uh, concepts and ideas that are in our tools box. Of course, we do, you know, take the tools that are particularly useful to address particular problems. You know, so it's a it's a set, a tools set, a tools box from which we can actually mobilize those concepts, you know, or those conceptual tools that work to us, work for us to address particular problems, as it were. 
that is why uh, you know, a wide range of theories are very necessary for us to engage with. Hence my recommendation for a conversational approach. Thank you very much. I just wanted to interject. Um, there are two questions in the chat um, and uh, and possibly uh, people would want, want to engage them as part of their set of responses because we may not have time for a second round of questions. So the first question is to what extent will sociological theories be impacted by one big data algorithms, which are forms of social incarnations, and two quantum approaches to understanding the social. And the second question is, how do we decide what good theoretical material is and what is not? To the UCT speaker, Faisal, uh, what theory do you recommend to understand corruption and state capture? So you can add those to the bundle. I don't know if obvious you want to say anything more or, or we go to um, uh, to uh, Vasu. Uh, I think we can go to others. Uh, then maybe I, I will read through the chat and uh, if I have to come back, uh, I will do that. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. Shall I just go through? Please go. Yes, of course. No, no, thank you. I mean, look, I mean, these are really elegant questions. I, I, I don't have definitive answers. Uh, I think they become subjects of conversations in on their own. But it's it's a really interesting question, uh, the one on the notion of the empirical and whether it belongs in social theory courses and or how the empirical influences social theory courses. I mean, my view is yes, of course it does. Uh, I mean, the empirical is contingent. Uh, I mean, if you if 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 we if, if I had to rather be crude about it and say, you know, if you look at numbers and data and facts, uh, they don't stand on their own. I mean, they uh, they're 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 operating within a system of ideas uh, that shape how those uh, uh, facts become theorized. I mean, uh, the the Durkheim text on suicide. I mean, you know, is uh, the result of very interesting empirical evidence. I mean, archival at that, but also shape. Uh, shaped by uh, a formulation of ideas, uh, you know, the theory and and the empirical are deeply interwoven in my sense. I mean, they 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 shape each other in different ways. It's almost virtually impossible to to think about it. I mean, if we're to look at the quantitative versus the qualitative, generally, I mean, people always attach a particular truth value to numbers. But the question we would ask theoretically is what's the story behind the numbers? What does it tell and what does it not tell? And I think theory enables us to surface those bigger questions, uh, that which is probably concealed and hidden. Uh, and, and for that, that reason, I think, uh, you know, uh, the empirical and theory really uh, influence each other. And certainly uh, my view is that uh, sociology is not the only discipline that can claim uh, theory. I think it belongs to a variety of disciplines uh, in a way that 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 is partly, you know, a, a response to the third question. I'll come to the second one now around the knowledge outside of the social theory. I mean, you know, do you take into account history, politics, anthropology? My own view in teaching uh, social theory is to share with students the prospect that theory is it's not a it's not a discipline it's an anti-discipline it's a set of practices and ideas that are borrowing from a range of domains and knowledge fields I and mean, then it's almost impossible to exclude history and politics when you read capital or the communist manifesto i mean marx was not concocting this over a drink uh, i mean he was reflecting and representing a particular set of historical conditions, as colleagues have been saying, in writing Das Kapital. Uh, I mean, the volume one is about a topic that we all talk about today, which is really centered on money, uh, which is really the thematic uh, in that in that first volume. And really, I mean, looking at class struggles way back then, context might have changed, but the uh, the, the the resonance with with our diverse context, I think, uh, says a lot. It's impossible, therefore, if I'm responding to the third question around history and politics, to to exclude that. I mean, if you talk about power as an example, I mean, how do you approach it purely from a Foucauldian perspective? I mean, Foucault was a hist historian of ideas. Uh, he's taken up in politics, taken up in sociology, in literature, gender, and so on and so forth. So I, I think uh, 
everything is contingent in my view uh, and that 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 makes sense for me uh, the the issue of the anthropocene i think is an important one i would agree i don't think it is centered or foregrounded enough in social theory we do we i think some in ways maybe i speak about myself i mean pay lip service to the the role of the human uh, in, in in a way. But I mean, the question that was posed around racial capital and et cetera, I think we should be doing more in that area. Uh, I mean, I couldn't but agree with Lauren's comment on the issue of, you know, uh, everyday life. I mean, it's, it's one of those issues I raised and I say to students as well, it's important to consider uh, the theory is not operating in a vacuum. It actually is uh, circulating around us. Uh, it's everything is relational. I mean, that's typically sociological as well. Um, yeah, let me let me stop there, Bernard. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Faisal. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Said, and uh, <clears throat> thanks to um, the, all the people who have asked their questions. So I'll just try and uh, you know respond to some of the questions. Uh, that's well, one question directed to me and some of the questions that I think I have something to, to add to. Um, so to the first one, um, does the notion of the idea of the empirical belong to social theory courses? Um, uh, well, a number of responses, I think, have um, adequately dealt with that. But I just want to add one kind of um, dramatic kind of angle to this. Uh, so there's that joke, which I'm not sure is a joke, actually, about how <clears throat> You know, um, Marx um, will occasionally come out of the British Library to, to 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 see if the revolution had begun whenever he had commotion outside. Um, so so basically, theory, I think, is an attempt to deal with very concrete issues, um, of course, relationally, uh, in order to draw some broad outlines that could serve as guiding principles. Um, of course, there's theory of theory you know, um, at a certain level of abstraction. But I think even that seeks to understand or come to terms with the, 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 the concrete. And so in class, for example, um, at any rate, in the courses that I teach, as um, we proceed from very concrete sets of issues and themes. Uh, and the tutorials are actually meant to get students to read the text closely um, uh, uh, while locating themselves in some uh, very immediate um, issues that have resonance elsewhere. So, 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 so the concrete, uh, sorry, the, the empirical is very, very important in, 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 in theorizing, but also in teaching theory, because it is often empirical work that grounds, confound, or uh, extend uh, theory. Uh, the, the, the question on, on the Anthropocene, um, so the text by Manuela Boatka that we do in the postgraduate course on contemporary social theory, you know, seeks to um, grapple with the question of uh, accumulation, but also the, 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 the centrality or the centralization of, of, of humans in, in in this in this process uh, to uh, uh, at the expense of, you know, the wider uh, 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 living or non-living uh, uh, components of, of 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 the world. So 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 while it is not addressed frontally as Anthropocene, uh, but the issues uh, that come with it are addressed, uh, including the question of of how can one rethink um, uh, uh, this is the relationship between humans and 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 you know what is around them. Um, so that text, Global Inequality Beyond Occidentalism by Manuela Boatka, tries to do that and we grapple with it in class. Um, the question around history, I think, is very, very important. Uh, so as I said, uh, the, the structure of the undergraduate course is such that students do a close reading guided by uh, a question which is located in very concrete contemporary issue. But the lecture is aimed at locating the outlines of a theoretical text, the arguments in the texts in time, when it happened, but also uh, uh, in place where it happened. So, so history is really important in this because um, else we decontextualize theories and, um, and often some of, I think, the wrong-headed kind of rejection of, 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 of setting um, theories 
uh, really is a result of that, you know, this decontextualization, you know. And I think often um, teaching by reification causes that. If you teach a theory as if this is a reified set of ideas, you know, that hold uh, constant across space, you know, that then one falls into this uh, historicity in, 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 in how one teaches. But I think history is, is really, really, really crucial. So at the first year, I used to um, uh, be part of the first year teaching team at UCT uh, Sociology, and I do a model on, 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 on historical sociology, mainly kind of focusing on the African continent, but, you know, a relationship between the African continent and other parts of the world historically. And, and, and you know, that opens students to a way of thinking the present in relation um, with the, the, the past. So the question around uh, what do you recommend to understand corruption and state capture? Um, there are a number of texts. I mean, the institutional approach is so in, in, in political science, you know, has you know, it's got a number of, um, of, 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 of theoretical texts to understand that. I mean, I don't agree with it, but I think uh, Bayat's uh, The Politics of the Belly, you know, could be a good starting point. I don't agree with it, but I think, you know, it mobilizes interesting historical arguments, you know, to make its point. Why I find the Peter A.K. text useful in understanding state capture and why I recommend it is one, it avoids binaries. Um, what it does instead is to historicize, which I think is really important uh, to show how things come into being and to avoid the temptation of essence, you see, um, to show the ways in which particular ways of thinking give rise to certain relationship to the public, to public goods, to, 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 to the differentiation between what is the public and what is the private, what can one appropriate and what can, can't one appropriate and how that, in a sense, is rooted in the form of capitalism that, 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 that colonialism mediated in state formation. So for me, the text by Peter A.K. is important because it is, as I said, really grounded in history, but also avoids the traps, you know, of, of essence, you know, which some of them, some of the other texts really uh, dangerously fall into that, you know, uh, whether it's the African mind or, you know, African culture, whatever other uh, uh, kind of misguided uh, essence. So, so yeah, thank you. I think I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I know we've gone over time, but it's been a fascinating discussion. So I'd like to give the last um, the last um, opportunity to Marlies um, to kind of wrap things up for us. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I, I just want to make one quick comment. Um, since we all started to teach online, I find that people are actually more engaged, um, as is happening at the moment as well, because um, as we are talking, people are, are writing and chatting. So maybe just to make um, a few links there. As people, all the speakers have said, and I think most people who are part of this discussion are also understanding, is that theory doesn't just happen, it doesn't fall out of the sky. Theory comes from empirical work, and then it is developed and put into a theoretical perspective that is wanting to explain something more that is maybe applicable to another context as well. So this interrelationship between theory and, and empirical work is, is, is what it's about. I mean, we, we cannot do the one without the other. It doesn't make any sense. Um, in Yes, history, philosophy, they are obviously very important elements of sociology, um, anthropology as well, um, economics. We can look at uh, quite a few discipline um, uh, sister disciplines, this is what I wanted to say, related disciplines. Um, these, they, they work together and, and they say something to one to one another. And uh, Lauren's comment about the Love Island and Goffman, my students very recently also looked at Goffman, but his presentation of the everyday, presentation of the self, and they immediately could make the link between what he was saying and their own social media profiles. Immediately, I didn't even have to coach them or say anything, they just made the, the jump immediately. Um, so, but Goffman is of course a text that is easy to apply to, to, him, to, to the world we live in because that is the way um, his theory works. So other theories are maybe not so easy to apply immediately. And I think that is where the close reading and, and, and the guidance from a social theory module um, is useful. So um, yes to E. Horan. Um, I think it's important that we look at things such as philosophy, but it's not the only system, uh, discipline that I want to say. There was another one who had an interesting comment here. Oh, yes, the Anthropocene um, that, that was raised. Yes, indeed. Um, the text that I've 
refer to comes from philosophy, um, Mokobe, Mokobe Ramose. Um, he's been working on this, um, and, and, and there's a whole text on that, if anybody's interested in that. And that is one of the areas that at UWC that, that we are thinking of developing far more in terms of research. We have a specialist in the field that want to branch out in there, and we also have possible linkages with other, with other universities in the global north. Um, and then the racial aspect of that will definitely come through. So for me, it seems, if I may say the last thing, there is a lot of thinking that um, is useful for us to, to look at in this particular, if I can say, room. But it's also quite interesting how, even though we use different texts, perhaps, and different backgrounds, but that we come to very similar conclusions, it seems to me. Um, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Well, thank, thank you everybody um, for uh, um, for speaking. I really appreciate your engaged responses to my provocations, um, and and uh, and thanks everybody for for being part of it. I know questions have appeared in the chat that haven't been responded to immediately, but um, uh, I believe that this is a beginning of a discussion, not an end. So so thanks everybody for your time and. Um, I'll give the last word to Shahid, maybe. Okay, no, no, by all means, thank you. I think thank you for coming, and uh, yeah, um, please uh, please join us next time for the next semester seminar. Great.